Welcome to episode number 98 of the Giant Take Podcast. I'm Josh, and I'm joined by my co-host, Alex. We are here today to discuss Giants news, obviously. We had the mandatory minicamp uh, beginning the other day, yesterday, and we have an interview with JQ coming up for you in a little bit. We're going to run through this intro as quick as possible so we can get you right to the interview. First of all, I'd like to figure out how Alex is doing, and Alex has some really good news to share with you. I forgot about that. So, Alex, I'll, I'll let you take it away. How are you? So, I'm doing really good. Well, actually, I can't lie. I'm doing terrible right now because it is about 900 degrees in New Jersey at the moment. And I, obviously, if you live here, you know that. But, oh, my God, it's so hot. And sorry for this, but there is probably air conditioning sound in the background. It just has to be on. Otherwise, I may suffocate. So, it just has to be on. Um, but, yeah, I'm doing good besides that. I'm excited to talk a little bit. Uh, some Giants, and obviously we talked a lot of Giants with JQ, and it was really fun talking to him, so I hope you guys enjoy that. But yeah, I don't actually know what I have something very exciting to tell you, because I actually don't know. I, or I just forgot. That's a joke, right? Are you kidding me? Alex delivered this week, okay? Oh, You're... I tweeted. I tweeted. <laughs> you didn't just tweet. You tweeted, Alex, <laughs> like multiple times. Because you realized you were trying to make up for the three weeks that you didn't tweet, it seemed like. Did I do three, tw- did I do three tweets? Let's see. Pulling up yeah. Alex's Twitter, he retweeted something about Sam Darnold from like a minute ago because we were talking about <laughs> it. He thought it was so funny. Um, was really funny. Sam Darnold is um, looking... Evaluating in- the situation. Eva- no, he's evaluating it. Don't worry about it. Sam Donald in a press conference admitted that he had not gotten the COVID vaccine yet. Um, and the new head coach from Baylor that I just can't think of the name of, do you have it? Matt Rule, um, well, you know, doesn't force his players to get it, which is, it's fine. It's a choice, but it's like you're evaluating the situation months into people already getting the vaccine. <laughs> so that's the one thing. Um, and someone responded to that by saying, uh, Sam Darnold, well, that's surprising. It's not like he hasn't gotten any infectious diseases before. That was one of them. And Alex retweeted one of uh, people basically like think like doing like the Monday Night Football picture where it's a Sam Darnold, his name, and then him pointing to the camera. And it's him pointing to the camera saying, evaluating COVID-19. Um, but anyway, Alex, so you tweeted about Ch- uh, Christian Pulisic and uh, America. You tweeted about our new episode of our new podcast, Check It Out, The City That Never Sleeps. And you tweeted... A third time, like you said, three times to make up for the three weeks that you missed about the new episode of The Giant Take that came out last week. So, Alex, congratulations. Oh, yeah. Congratulations to me. Um, Yeah, I'm very proud of what I've done. Hopefully more tweets are going to be coming. And, uh, yeah. And also, it wasn't just a normal tweet, the one about um, uh, Christian Pulisic and the U.S. national team who won the CONCACAF, uh, whatever it's called. I don't know what it's even called. CONCACAF Nations Nations League league or whatever what i've never you know it's new whatever who cares but i retweeted it i quote tweeted it that was impressive anyone who you like you know you i didn't just do a re <laughs> josh is laughing at me i did i didn't just do a retweet i retweeted it with the comment and it was a tweet highlighting the other tweet it was truly impressive so i'm really proud of myself all right so we're gonna run through some stuff that we saw and heard about during this mandatory mini camp so we can get you to the interview. Like I said, we don't want this episode going any far too long. So I'll run through bullet points. Alex will run through bullet points. How does that sound? Sounds great. Okay, not waiting for your answer, Alex. All right, I'm, I'm speed running now. I'm going crazy. Um, Kenny Galladay and Daniel Jones are building a connection. We heard about that on the Zoom yesterday. We mentioned in the interview as well um, that Galladay said, that's my boy when talking about Daniel Jones in the press conference. Like JQ mentioned, I'm stealing it from the interview. Uh, we saw them at Knicks games together, and we also, you know, have seen them in videos. They're, you know, staying together. They're building a friendship, building a bond. You hope that transmits on the field. And we also saw a video today of Kenny Galladay catching a ball one hand in the end zone from Daniel Jones. So I'll take that. Thank you very much. Um, and let's hope that really, really, you know, happens on the football field and those deep throws because Daniel Jones is a deep thrower, really good percentage when throwing deep, as Alex always likes to note. Um, and I don't like to admit. And then Kenny Galladay is really good catching the ball deep, and he's a deep zone threat. So let's hope those two things work together nicely. The Giants' preseason dates are out. We already found out a few of them 
We also found out that the week that the Cleveland Browns are playing the New York Giants in preseason, Kevin Stefanski talked about it today, that they are going to have a joint practice with the New York Giants. Now, that wouldn't be big if it was anything, you know, with any other team, but that's the return of Odell Beckham, and he'll be practicing with some former teammates. So that's, I think, what makes it big. And Baker Mayfield, as Alex likes to mention, about last season too, Daniel Jones, he had comments about that. So kind of interesting that there's been a few rivalries between players on each team. Um, and there's that. And so the preseason dates are August 14th against the New York Jets, the New York-New York rivalry, 7.30 p.m. Giants versus Browns, August 22nd at 1 p.m. It's an interesting 1 p.m. I think that's a Saturday game. Saturday or Sunday, 1 p.m. game. I'm sorry, I don't have the uh, weekday for August 20. I think it's a Saturday game. I'm just going to go with that. And then Patriots-Giants on my birthday, Monday, August 29th at 6 p.m. So I'm happy about that. Um, and, and yeah, so those are the mini camp, the mini camp, the preseason dates. And then finally, uh, this will be the final thing for me, I think. Nope, there's, there's, I'll, that'll be the final thing for me. And then I'll let Alex go because I've been talking for a little bit. Logan Ryan, when he talked in this press conference, we already know he's recruiting players, uh, including Adoree Jackson. But another thing that he mentioned that was pretty cool was that he talked with some former New York Giants that were in that, you know, secondary including Anchel Roll, Jason Seahorn, and Corey Webster. So super cool that he was able to talk with them. And he basically said, you know, how do I, you know, how do I represent the New York Giants? Or I think it was like, how do I be a great player and stuff like that? And to talk to some really good former Giants in that secondary was a really cool thing um, that Logan Ryan did. These were all kind of positive things. Alex, um, I guess... I'll, you know, lead you to the next thing. This is kind of a negative thing, kind of sad thing that happened, um, you know, over the past few days uh, when regarding the New York Giants. Yeah, so former Giants coach John Fassel has passed away at the age of 71. He was 1997 coach of the year for the Giants, and he was the Giants head coach from 1997 to 2003, uh, where he led the Giants to that Super Bowl in 2001 that we all want to forget, but he still led us there uh, to that Super Bowl. So it was very sad seeing him pass away. And, uh, you know, lots of people were, you know, tweeting about uh, his passing as well. A lot of former Giants uh, grateful for his contribution to the organization. Um, going back to the present day, another kind of bit of bad news. Kelvin Benjamin walked off halfway during practice uh, with a trainer. He was injured, uh, presumably during that, uh, during that practice. So that's not good. We don't really have an update on what's going on with him yet. Uh, but we'll see that soon. John Ross has not been seen at practice Tuesday or Wednesday, but it turns out he has magically appeared. He's been stretching on the sideline. So if anyone's interested about that, um, he has been stretching on the sideline. He did magically appear today. Good to see him at the facility. Hopefully he can do a bit more than stretching very soon. And rehabbing inside, obviously, the people that we know, uh, Saquon Barkley, Kyle Rudolph, Ryan Anderson, and then, of course, John Ross. He came outside. He did some stretches, and he's probably back inside by now. <laughs> yeah, um, obviously, going back to the uh, earlier point, uh, John Fossil, yeah, that, that was really upsetting. Um, obviously, I talked to my father about it because he kind of had more personal experience than I did with him being the coach, obviously, 1997 to 2003. Um, we, were not a lot, we were not alive then, so... You know, having someone who did have the point of view of seeing him as the Giants head coach at the time was a really cool thing. Obviously, spent some time with the Cowboys as well as a special teams coordinator. Um, yeah, and, and 71, man, that that's so young, especially, you know, now in this current day and age. It died from a heart attack at 71. So, you know, that's that's some sad stuff. But um, Kadarius Toney, uh, another player that's been rehabbing from some injuries during OTAs, during rookie minicamp. Again, still an injury. Nothing to worry about. I know um, he'll have a month to recover on his own, but again, didn't finish the workouts, but he was in cleats today, I saw, so that's good. Um, and then Patrick Graham, um, I really like this. This is a great thing. I know Justin, uh, Justin Pennock, obviously from Talking Giants, tweeted out like three checks today. Uh, and one of those checks was that Pat Graham in the press conference today addressing uh, that he turned down for the Jets head coaching interview, saying, quote, the Giants, this is my dream job. To be here as a defensive coordinator, I'm just happy to be here. It's nothing against them. Great words from Pat Graham. And I'm glad that he actually addressed it because usually coaches don't really address it head on like that. And he said, this is where I want to be as the defensive coordinator of the Giants. So I thought that was really cool. 
And um, I mean, that's it for me for the intro. Alex, you got anything else? No, I don't have anything else. Um, I think we're ready to go to the interview. Uh, very fun time with JQ. We really appreciate him coming on. Uh, and we're definitely going to work with him more in the future. Uh, very nice guy and very knowledgeable about the Giants. So let's head over to the interview now. Okay, we are back now with our very special guest, JQ. And JQ, we talked obviously prior to the draft, but this is your first time coming back on the podcast itself. We were, we were doing the Instagram live, I think, day of the draft or day before the draft. And now you're coming back on and Alex is here. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to ask, how are you doing, man? Josh, Alex, I'm doing well, guys. Thanks for having me back on. And Josh, like you said, I think we did that little pre-draft live stream right before the NFL draft. It might have been the day of, or I think it was Wednesday, the night before the draft, like, you know, Christmas Eve the night before. So that was a lot of fun. I had a bunch of fun. The draft went very well for the Giants. But guys, I've been doing really well, man. Summer's off to a good start. I just graduated college. So it's kind of interesting to say that right now. I can't believe I'm saying those words. It's a big accomplishment for myself. But I'm good. How are you, how are you boys doing? How's school? I know you guys are still in school till like the end of June, which I find is insane. Yeah, it is kind of it's kind of crazy. You know, it, it's difficult balancing school with the podcast. That's definitely something that's that's challenging. In the off season, it's not as bad because you know things slow down a bit. Um, but especially during the season, I remember uh, last you know, last year in the fall. It was definitely a, a, a struggle to get everything together, you know, when you're doing the recaps and the previews of all the games, talking about everything. It's a lot more to, to handle. But, uh, yeah, the summer summer's always a nice time because everything kind of slows down a bit, and uh, hopefully that'll be nice for us. But, yeah, I mean, I'm doing well, and uh, I think Josh is too. Awesome. Yeah, speaking for me, Alex, I am. I am Sorry. doing. <laughs> I no, it's all good. I am doing well, and uh, yeah, we are excited to have you on. So I guess I want to just start off with because we weren't able to talk uh, publicly post draft. Obviously, we texted back and forth, but I guess just your thoughts on the overall draft, the picks. You kind of you know alluded to it a little bit, uh, but just go further into it. What you think of each player? So it was definitely interesting because I honestly. I think every Giants fan thought that the Giants were going to be picking at the 11th overall pick, either if it was Devontae Smith, Micah Parsons, or Jalen Waddell. And then they get none of those guys, and a whole twist happens. The draft really got weird for me with the Cincinnati Bengals pick when they went with Jamar Chase. And then I, then I was like, these wide receiver weapons are going to start going off the board. But overall, it was a, dra a great draft night for me personally, and of course all Giants fans out there, and the New York Giants as well. They got another weapon for Daniel Jones, which wish they highlighted to in one of their YouTube videos on the New York Giants official uh, YouTube channel. That's what Joe Judge said. They said they wanted to focus on getting an edge rusher in this year's draft class and getting another weapon for Daniel. And they did both of those in the first two rounds. And honestly, I think the steal of the draft for the Giants was getting in the second round, getting a Z Ojolari late in the second round. They traded back for him as well, gained some more capital, which they ended up trading those uh, whatever picks they got ended up trading those to draft Aaron Robinson, the cornerback, out of UFC. So it was it was a very interesting draft. I'm very happy with Kadarius Tony. Like they say, they call him the human joystick. The kid can do it all. I saw at many camps the other day he's throwing a football like 50 yards on like a line, like on a like on a laser, man. It's, he's like throws the ball like a laser pointer. The ball does not move. And it's pretty interesting to see how Jason Garrett can like put him into the offensive scheme this year. And I'm just really excited. And – like we've always talked about, guys, the Giants have need that presence off the edge. They got it from Leonard Williams last year, but they're going to get a lot more help with Z Ojolari. So I was very happy with it. How about you guys? I, I mean, I was happy with it. I, I I like the first – I mean, eventually when you get deeper into the, the later rounds, it's kind of hard to judge. But I, I liked what we did in the first three rounds specifically because, you know, obviously – you could tell a little bit more whether they were the right picks or not. Uh, the fourth round pick, Ellerson Smith, I think will be a really interesting player to watch. Maybe not the best player right away, but I think, you know, he has all the physical attributes to be very, very good in the NFL. And, and, and you know, maybe he comes off the edge, but I think he can play at a whole bunch of different positions just because of his frame. Uh, and I think it'll be interesting to see how he develops. A small school guy, too. So those are always some more interesting players. Aaron Robinson, I think, is a really good pickup as well in the third round. I really like him and his flexibility if he can play on the outside in the slot. 
give Darnay Holmes a little bit of a challenge because Darnay Holmes was good last season, but, you know, there's obviously always room to improve uh, at every position. So I think that's going to be a nice, interesting training camp battle too. And uh, and for Aziz Ojolari, we needed help desperately on the edge. Uh, you know, Kyler Fackrell, he's someone who provided some pressure, pressure for us last season. He's gone. You know, we don't really have any, you know, O'Shane Zimenez, Lorenzo Carter, both extremely injury prone. We don't really know what we're going to get from them. I think I think uh, Aziz Ojolari was a really good pickup, and Kadarius Tony. You know, I think he he's an interesting type of wide receiver. Uh, you know, people are comparing him to whole a whole bunch of different things. Percy Harvin, you know, Curtis Samuel. I don't know which one's exactly the best comparison. I would say none of them because he's kind of his own type of player, really. And I'm excited to see what he does. You know, there was definitely an interesting there was a large amount of players or wide receivers specifically that they could have taken there. So I'm interested to see why they went Kadarius Tony. I was a little bit confused at the time why they didn't go Bateman. Now I think I understand it because Bateman is probably more similar to some of the wide receivers we already have on our team. And I think Kadarius Tony is a different type of wide receiver that we could definitely utilize in the offense. And that's my thing, uh, Alex, you brought up that point about uh, Bateman. Uh, he's a good receiver. I liked what he did. But then you look at a guy like Kenny Galladay, and you can kind of say they have the same body frame, they have the same mold, and they kind of play football the same way, deep threats down the field, across the middle of the field. Those guys are going to go up and catch, and catch the contested jump balls here and there. So, honestly, I'm kind of happy they didn't pick him because, like you said, you got a guy coming in like Kadarius Tony, this Giants offense. They can do whatever they want with him. So that's what I'm mostly looking forward to this offseason and, of course, going into – the three preseason games they have coming up, and then, of course, the start of the season against the Broncos at home. The Giants have them. So I'm just super excited. I think Kadarius Tony's a cool guy. He also doesn't have eyebrows. He always has his eyebrows shaved. So I think that's something funny to always mention when I talk about him. Yeah, and also, you know, when you do a comparison for Kadarius Tony, the most similar player on the roster at the moment is Sterling Shepard. And Sterling Shepard is someone who's most likely, due to his contract, due to his injury concerns, not going to be someone in the long-term future of the New York Giants. So I think, you know, Kenny Galladay obviously just signed a four-year deal. He's not going anywhere for quite a while. I think, you know, Sterling Shepard could be gone very soon by next offseason. And I think Kadarius Toney's a nice replacement for him there. Uh, so I, I did like the pickup, you know, as I thought about it, because obviously emotions are high right on the draft, right on the draft night. You don't really know what, you know, what's going on. Um, but after you sit down, think about it, then, uh, you know, it kind of all makes sense. But, yeah, I was happy with how the Giants drafted, uh, you know, drafted in general. And uh, I'm just excited to see how some of those late-round guys, too, like Radarius Williams, I think he could be some, you know, a good uh, piece there on the defense in the secondary. I'm just excited to see how they get along. And that's the thing, Alex, like you've been saying this whole time. We're not going to get to see us fans how they are until they go through all these mandatory mini camps and OTAs now. And then once we see them playing in preseason games and hopefully – these guys like Ellerson Smith and the rest of them that were drafted after that, Gary Brightwell and Radarius Williams, we hope they make the 53-man roster so we get to see what type of talent they have. Because if you get drafted by a team, guys, this is what I think personally as a fan, if a team is willing to draft you, they could see you making the 53-man roster. So that's why I think it's very important for these guys to go out there, get as many reps as they can during these off-season months to make sure – they have a shot at making the team. One of those guys, Ellerson Smith, I really like him. And like you said, Alex, he could be a versatile weapon, whether he's coming off the edge or maybe like an outside linebacker role or something like that, dropping back in the coverage. He's a big dude. So it's going to be exciting to see how they all line up and what type of scheme fits Patrick Graham has for them on hand. So I'm just very excited, guys. Josh, I haven't heard you a little bit right now. So what do you think about all this? Because Alex and I have kind of been stealing the show for a little bit. No, I mean, we, we were kind of, like I said, we texted about it a little bit. You know, Kadarius Tony was an interesting player when we got drafted. We were like, really interesting, you know. But I, I remember when we were on the live stream, I mentioned that a lot of experts kind of said that Kadarius Tony, like, it was someone we just didn't even mention because it was at 11. Uh, but I, I, I remember, like, I kind of slid in there and, was, and I said, some experts say that Kadarius Tony is, like, a really good player. So, listen, I, I, I like to pick up. Obviously, we have to see him play, um, you know, and, and hopefully he's good 
by training camp, I know it's just a little bit of an injury, but the last two days, it seems like he's been struggling, struggling with an injury. The voluntary rookie mini camp OTAs type thing, we saw him with an injury. So I don't know what's going on. Hopefully it's like a little, a little thing. It shouldn't be that big of a deal. Aziz Ojolari. Yeah, go ahead. I don't think it's anything to uh, us fans should really be concerned about. I mean, if he's out there practicing right now, I'm sure the Giants, that their coaching staff is not going to overwork him during this time. He's a first round pick for a reason, guys. That's what I think. And He's got a lot of value to this team, and I think we're going to see it come week one. And, of course, you'll probably see him out on the field a little bit during preseason. But that's what they're doing with Saquon Barkley. They're not going to rush him back this year. They're going to give him all the time in the world, all the time he needs. They picked up that fifth-year option for a reason. They want to see this guy play for years to come. So that's that's my take on that. Yeah, and then just Ojolari. The, again, the steal in the draft, and then you guys mentioned the rest of the, you know, the rest of the players. Obviously, high upside, you would hope, and uh, hopefully they develop. And yeah, Aaron Robinson out of uh, UCF, good player, and hopefully he's really good. The only thing that I mentioned with him, we kind of like recap the draft, is uh, he's very handsy with the ball, and those there could be some penalties there. But hopefully, you, you know, you think the rest will play it out. It's NFL football, so if both players, the wide receiver and the cornerback, are getting a little handsy, you shouldn't really call pass interference on either of them. Going back to our last episode, we did NFL power rankings, and I just want to know where you would place the Giants out of one of these 32 teams. Alex had him at 18. I had him at I had him at 21. Where do you think? Where do you see them shaping out? It, and it could be right now. It could be during the season. Whatever you want to do. Where would you rank them out of the 32 teams in this NFL? Where I rank the Giants right now, guys, I got to be honest with you. They got to be lower than 25. We've seen in years past our favorite team is always like bottom of the tier in that top 32 tier list, always like towards the bottom, like 25 and below. I like where Alex is saying around 18. I honestly can say anywhere in that range between both you, Josh, and Alex, between 18 and 21. I could see them slipping down into the top 15 during the season because of the way that defense played last year. If it carries over into week one and throughout the beginning part of the season, that's going to be tremendous for them. And it all depends on the offense. You never know. As fans, we like to – honestly, I'm a very biased fan, so I would love to say top 10, one of the top 10 teams in the NFL and the winner and the champions of the NFC East going into playoff time around the, those months of December and January. But we'll never know. We'll never know until the season officially begins and the Giants get at least a couple weeks into the season. But back to my point, I say anywhere from top 15 to top 20 teams. That's where they should be, I think, at least to start out the season. So I have an interesting point. This isn't Giants related, just in general NFL for the power rankings. Josh and I had a little disagreement over this. So for the number one uh, team in the power rankings, for me, I had the Buccaneers and Josh had the Chiefs. I find it weird. I feel like you can't not have the Super Bowl champions at the number one spot in the power rankings. You know, I, I see all the professionals, all, all the journalists have, you know, the Chiefs at number one, and I just don't understand it. I don't know. Do you do you agree with them or am I like, you know, I do. I, I agree with Josh. I'm sorry, but I do agree <laughs> with Alex on this. I think if your team or excuse me, if that that team, let's say, for example, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they just want a Super Bowl. I think going into next season, no matter what offseason moves both of those two teams made who fought for the Super Bowl, the Chiefs and the Buccaneers, I think it's got to be the Buccaneers. And then it's the Chiefs in second. It should be like that every yeah. year. It's like, for example, when the Giants beat the Patriots in 2011, 2012, that year, they probably should have been ranked number one in the power rankings going into next season, and then New England would be right behind them. I think it's like, obviously, you know, it all can change because, like I said before, these teams add on so many additions or they lose guys during the offseason. But I still think it doesn't matter because they are just coming off winning a title. That's what it's all about. Getting a good team together, building a good chemistry, and making a run into the playoffs, hopefully, but then after that, hopefully winning what it's all about, the NFL Lombardi Trophy. So that's what I think personally, but it could go either way. Obviously, the Chiefs just revamped their whole offensive line, so you can look at them and be like, wow, like they're in a good spot. Obviously, they do everything right, the Kansas City Chiefs. They got Andy Reid. It's a good coaching staff there. So it'll be interesting to see. Maybe after a couple weeks, I think the Chiefs will slip right back into that number one spot. Any – performers any players you see standing out in training camp so far it's got to be kenny galladay i just think that's everyone every giants fan wish list guy right there they got him in they got a number one weapon for daniel jones this giants front office did a phenomenal job during this offseason and he's all over the highlight reel i'm not just saying 
I'm not saying this because like he's making outstanding plays at OTAs and at minicamp, but I'm just saying he's got all the cameras on him. They're, all the fans want to see what Kenny Galladay and Daniel Jones are doing. And as fans, we heard it the other day, Kenny Galladay and Daniel Jones have been hanging out hanging out a lot this offseason before OTAs and all that stuff started. We've seen them all at Nick games and stuff like that, hanging out, probably getting dinners all the time. And then we saw it the other day, Kenny Galladay in his press conference says, that's my boy, DJ's my boy. So that's something that all Giants fans should be super excited about going into the season. But I think he's the, the spotlight of the show. Obviously, if you have Barkley there, I know he's not participating right now, but he would also be another guy that's in the spotlight. But it's got to be Kenny Kenny G, guys. He's all over the cameras. Every time I scroll through Twitter during my breaks at work, I'm like, oh, there's Kenny Galladay. Oh, there's Kenny Galladay. And also Stilling Shepard with the number three, which he looks fire in. I will say that. You know, I want to discuss the number three. See, you keep saying things, and instead of moving on uh, to the next topic, I just got to stay here. What is your opinion about the changing of the numbers for these players? So I, I'm kind of against it. I'll, I'll explain why in a second, but I just want to hear your view on it. So, like, I'm kind of torn between it because obviously, like, a guy like Sterling Shepard, he's doing this because of his father who passed away. His father wore number three during his college career as well. And it's just kind of like a symbolized thing. If he wants to do it, like, I'm totally fine with that. But then, Alex, this is probably what you, the side you're on. Then all the fans that have bought his jersey with number 87, they're kind of stuck with these jerseys now, and there's no value behind it, I feel like, anymore. And then all these players have to pay so much money to pay, I'm pretty sure, pay off all those jerseys that are in stock or, like, in the factories wherever being made for that number 87 Sterling Shepard. I personally think if you have a Sterling Shepard jersey and it's number 87, you should be able to turn it in, not get a refund, but exchange it for the number three Sterling Shepard jersey. But obviously everything's about making money, Alex and Josh, so that probably won't happen. But what was your point, Alex? I mean, I like you said in the second point in the negative there, I kind of agree with the fact that, you know, fans are spending their hard-earned money on supporting their team and they're buying, you know, these players' jerseys and then they're, they, you know, jerseys are not cheap, right? They're, you know, expensive. It, it might take, it's a whole paycheck for some people to, uh, you know, purchase a jersey. So I, I kind of find it a little bit disrespectful sometimes for just players who are doing it for no reason besides the fact that they just want to change their number because of the fans, you know, who invested their hard-earned money into those players and really are such big fans of them that they decide to buy their jersey. And then from there, the value of their jersey going from $100 to zero right away. It, it, I just feel like it's not the right thing to do, you know, how it looks, I don't think it really matters what player wears what jersey number. You know, from now on, I feel like a better rule would have been from now on when a new player comes into the league, they could, you know, have their jersey number, you know, in the in the one digits if you're a wide receiver or whatever. So I feel like that would have been a better solution. But then the players, it's not fair to the players who are already in the NFL. So it could go both ways, Alex, man. And that's like what like the the weird thing about it is. It's cool, don't get me wrong, because now we're going to see guys like Jalen Ramsey he used to wear number 20. Now I'm pretty sure he's wearing number five. It's just like a total like change of pace and like change of like, I guess, vibes. Honestly, we'll see. Like Kadarius Tony, he was a guy that wore single digits in college and now he's wearing number 89. So it's like a huge change. But I think I think it's cool. But obviously, Alex, I do agree with your points. I think it's like you got to think of the fans who have bought their jerseys for years now. They should get something back or that number three Sterling Shepard jersey in exchange. Yeah, and I mean, it was a debate when we kind of talked about it. So my point actually is different. I think it's just, I think that the numbers, uh, when it, when the, what the numbers were, just like what they were. Um, it's like, I actually care about the number itself change, not so much the jersey sales, meaning like receivers are like 80s. Like that's just like what they are. They're either, they're either 80s or they're in like the teens from 10 to 20. That's just like how I feel. Cornerbacks are... 20 to 40, whatever that is. Like, that's just how I view it. Um, and then with the jersey sales, I understand your, your guys' points. But then it's also, I feel like, a good thing. It's like you bought a Sterling Shepard jersey before he changed the number to three. And a Sterling Shepard goes on to, let's, uh, let's not say Sterling Shepard, that'll happen. But for these players who do change their numbers, you know, who knows? Maybe Sterling Shepard becomes a Hall of Famer and one of the best players to ever play for some of these players and the people that have their old jerseys the sales of that jersey will actually probably go up because there'll be less production of them. 
than these jerseys. It's kind of like with LeBron, just just an example, just because today the news came out, he's switching back to six on the Lakers next season. And LeBron has gone back between six and 2023 20, uh, with the Lakers and the Heat and the and the you know the Cleveland Cavaliers, so there could be a number six jersey from the Miami Heat that's going to sell more than a twenty three jersey. But like just an example like that, I f- I feel like you might even get higher prices if those players turn out good. Absolutely, Josh, I couldn't agree with your point more. That's the thing. It's like if they if they pop off or a guy like LeBron, he wants to switch his number. That old jersey six he used to wear it in Miami, like you said, it could be worth a lot of money someday. Now that is going back to it's kind of crazy how many times he's changed his jerseys. I think it's I think it's every season he doesn't make it to the finals or he doesn't win an NBA championship. I think he switches his jersey number either to twenty three or back to six. Yeah, well, LeBron LeBron uh, I don't think takes uh his the losses very well, so he probably has to uh change I, them when I that happens. <laughs> I agree with that, Alex. I I no complaints from me on that one. He he's a baby sometimes, but he is an amazing basketball player, I yeah. will say that. So for the, for training camp, obviously it starts what in about a month, a little over a month from now. Who is someone who maybe a lot of people aren't expecting to make the roster, but who you think would ma- is going to make the roster? I think you got to look at the draft picks right now, Josh and Alex. A guy like Ellerson Smith, a fourth round pick. Look at Darnay Holmes, probably going into the season as fans, we didn't expect him maybe to make the fifty three man roster, but be on the practice squad, and then look how. Of, look how much of a vital part of the defense he was last year. Didn't allow a single coverage touchdown last year in the slot, which is amazing as a rookie. He led all rookies in that category for cornerbacks. But it just someone like that, I look at Ellerson Smith. He's a big guy from, from like, not like a no-name school, but you know what I'm saying, like a smaller school, not like an Alabama or like an Ohio State or like Oklahoma, like schools like that. So you really want to see how he plays out. That's why I think when it comes time to training camp, if they're going to have fans at training camp, the New York Giants, I think it's going to be awesome to see what what he's made of. We want to see his reps too. Obviously, as a fan base, we're rooting for the team day in and day out, but we want to see what all the players can do that they've drafted the Giants. So I'm just very excited to see what he does. And a guy like Aaron Robertson too, because obviously Dave Gettleman said this before the NFL draft. It was in one of his press conferences. He's like, I'm not afraid to draft at a position that already has good value. I'm not afraid to add on positions – I'm not afraid to add on draft picks to a position that's already set in stone with like good players. Like for example, Bradbury. Now you got a Dory Jackson. They traded up in the third round of the Giants to draft Aaron Robinson. And I think it was a smart move. If you if you like a guy that much and you trade up for him, I expect to see him on the 53 man roster, no doubt in my mind. And he's a bigger guy than Darnay Holmes. He's bigger, he's a he's a quicker guy. He's a lang- he's a lengthy guy too. I looked at some of his strengths and weaknesses. He's just an all-around good defender, and he plays a lot of man coverage. That's what Patrick Graham said today in one of his press conferences. you got to be able to play man defense, man coverage, excuse me. So, like, on third down, when they want to blitz the quarterback, you don't have to worry about that because you got a Dory Jackson, you got James Bradbury, and you got Aaron Robinson in there to lock up these receivers. Now, I don't think Darnay Holmes is just going to be, like, a a scrub and be on the bench the rest of his career, but I think it's going to be a good one-two piece in the slot position. So... Listen, it's a slow time right now for Giants football. Obviously, it's going to rev up. Alex, if you got any more questions Giants related, you can go towards that. I'm, you know what? I'm going to, I'm sorry. I got to break it for right now. First of all, I see that your shirt, you got a Savages shirt on. So I'm going to have to ask you the question what the hell is going on with the Yankees hitting? We got the pitching. Bullpen's one of the best in the MLB. Starting rotation, it's eh. We're getting Kluber back, and you know by the All Star break, Severino's on his way up. What is going on with this Yankees hitting? They suck right now. It, it's so tough because you look at the Yankees this year, and you're, you always look at them, and you're like, they're probably going to make a run for the World Series. And then you look at the team this year, and you're like, what what's going on here? Like, what are we doing? What's going on? I think it's guys. I know the hitting hasn't been there. I am not a fan of Aaron Boone. I'm just not a fan of Boone. I don't see that firepower in him. And after this year, we saw it last year with Joe Judge. He plays with that mentality, work hard, play hard. Same with Tom Thibodeau, the New York Knicks. He just won coach of the year. I think the Yankees need someone like that who's going to be up everyone's behind day in and day out, making sure he gets the best out of their players. Boone, 
you know, Stan will come off a career night hitting wise. He'll hit a grand slam and maybe like have like three or four extra RBIs in the night. And Boone will be like, all right, you get the night off tomorrow. There's no rhythm being built for these hitters. I think the coaching staff in the New York Yankees, they're in trouble. The hitting coach, I think pitching is fine. Like you said, their bullpen's doing very well right now. But I think that's because they don't get to use them in certain games in certain situations because they're already down so many runs. What's the point of wasting arms at that point? So I think the Yankees are in a tough spot right now. I think the hitting is going to have to come a long way. I know it's a long season. They're probably not even at the halfway point just yet. Maybe they are, but they got a long ways to go. And I'd be scared if I was Aaron Boone for his job security. I'll say that much. Yeah, so, I mean, just like kind of alluding on your point, I, I feel like this weekend was like the pinnacle of that with Aaron Boone. You know, there's been talks, but this Boston series, getting swept is one thing. Getting swept the way we got swept is another thing. You know, we went to the – I don't know if you kept up with them this weekend, but we had – um, Boone in press conference say that good teams head into double plays, which is just like the BS response because the Yankees are one of the top teams that hit into double plays and Boone was asked about it. He's like, oh, even the best teams head into double plays. It's like, okay, it's just, it's just not not it. Um, and then I remember he had another answer. I forget what it, that was about um, in, in the press conference, but it was like another stupid thing like we're going to get on track, something like that. You know, we got to get in the flow. It's like it's it's June. You know, the flow should have happened by now. Um, and then there was the strike zone call against Odor. And, you know, the umpire, that was an awful call by the umpire. And you have Phil Nevin, you know, coming off. Hey, he had COVID, so he wasn't even supposed to be yelling at the umpire. And he storms out of the dugout, and he's going crazy. And then you have Boone. He I think either Nevin got ejected or, like, you know, someone got ejected. And Boone goes out there, he's like, oh, he didn't do it. And he didn't even get ejected. It, it's the bottom of the ninth. The Yankees can win this game. They can hit a walk-off. You would think your manager storming out there and yelling at, his, you know, at the umpire would get your team fired up. No, I'm just going to nicely talk to him. It's like he's just not clicking the button. He's, he's trying to click the buttons, I think. He's just not doing it correctly. He's missing the button, I really think is what it is. And do we clean house fully? We could get Brian Cashman out of there too. I don't know. But I agree that Boone's not the answer right now. That's what I agree with, Josh. I agree with a lot of the points you said. And that was that game against the Red Sox. That was just not a strike. Obviously, every fan watching knows that. And every beat reporter and broadcaster for the MLB Network probably saw that too. But listen, if he's not going to go out there and freak out like he did, and he's like, my guys are – Bleep savages in that box. You guys know what I, I want to say, but I'm not going to say it on the, while we're recording. But it's just you don't see that same you, firepower anymore. If you're uh, if you're watching on the YouTube, you're wearing it. You don't need to say it. Exactly. So. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, but no, man, it's it's they're an interesting team right now. The Yankees. That's why I'm happy the Giants. They found a great head coach. Personally, what I think, and they got a good coaching staff right now around him. They get along really well. It all seems like. And it seems like everyone's having a lot of fun there at these OTAs. It seems like, like Blake Martinez said today, the energy is awesome. Everyone is having a good time. The chemistry is great. And we're all just here learning and soaking as much information as we can and trying to get better and better every day. So I'm just happy that the Giants are in a good spot right now. And I'm just really excited for this season. And then one final thing before we wrap up. So I'm scrolling on my Twitter feed. Uh, what was it, yesterday, two days ago? And I, I passed JQ, and someone's meeting Obi Toppin. What, what's, what's going on there? Can we explain that? So I was at a, I was at a mall yesterday in Westchester, the, the Westchester Mall. I hate to give it away. Um, but I went with my girlfriend yesterday because she had to get her phone fixed at Apple, so the screen cracked. So they're like, come back in an hour, obviously. So we were like, all right, like whatever. It's going to take some time. It took a lot longer than that. It took like three hours. But we were like, we went home. But before, So like we stayed for an hour. And then when we when we went back to Apple, they said, come back at like 5.45, so like two hours later again. We're like, all right, let's go home. We'll come back. We're walking out, and I see this like very tall guy. And obviously when you see someone super tall, I just got like this thought in my head. I'm like, could he be in the NBA? And like, or like something like that. Or like, is he like a, uh, like a pro or like an athlete or someone like famous like that? I don't know. I just like, that's how I think sometimes. So all of a sudden, I like, I'm walking by him. And like I notice him, I'm like, that's definitely Obi Toppin. And he starts to go down an escalator, but when he's going down the escalator, it's off. So it's not like so you have to obviously walk down the escalator when it's off. It's not like you can get there and it takes you down. So as he's walking down and he like glances back up, I gave him like a little salute. And like I was like, I like start to pull my mask down. 
And I'm like, and like, obviously he stops because he, he pr probably could figure out I wanted to say something to him. And I was like, OB, like, what's good, man? How you doing? And he's like, like, super friendly guy. I mean, he's only a year older than me. I'm 22. I'm pretty sure he's 23, which is crazy to think about it. And I was just like, OB, like, what's up, man? Like, I just wanted to like say like, you had like a phenomenal season this year, man, and stuff. Like, I can't wait to see what you guys do next year. And he was like, he was super nice. Really nice guy. He kept giving me like fist pounds and stuff like that. It was really sick. I was like, you mind if we take a quick picture and everything? He's like, absolutely. So I got to take a picture with them, talk to him for a couple minutes. I asked him how the atmosphere was at the Garden this year with Fan and how the playoff experience was as a rookie. He's like, it's everything I ever wanted it to be, which was really cool. And he said, get ready. He, the last thing he said was, get ready for next year. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to get better. So it just it was kind of like a super nice kid, man. And he was with his family, I'm pretty sure, too, or maybe a couple of his buddies. But, you know, super nice guy to take five minutes out of his day just, you know, I asked him some questions, just wanted to say what's up, and got some pictures with him. So it was really cool. And he's huge. He's not like like a thick guy. Like you would think, I like every time I see him on TV, he looks bigger than he is. But tall wise, he's huge, but he's kind of like a thin guy. So it was cool to see like how tall he was. I felt like when he went to go put his arm around me, I was like underneath his armpit like this. And I was like, damn, you're a tall man. So it was funny. We cracked some jokes and it, we just had a good time. He was a very nice kid, man. Well, I guess when someone's six foot nine, they kind of st stick out like a like a tree. So, and especially uh, all the people he was walking with, Alex, they were not tall people. I hate to say it, but uh, I was like okay. taller than all like the relatives or whoever he was with. So it was kind of funny. Yeah. I'm only six foot, so I'm not like super tall. So for I guess we'll talk real quick about the Knicks anyway. So how are you feeling about how the Knicks performed in the playoffs? I'm not a Knicks fan, but Josh is, so. Uh, I'm sure I, I think it was it. tough, man. I think it was tough. Obviously, you know, I didn't see them going out in the first round. I honestly thought they were going to beat Atlanta because they did smack down the Hawks pretty bad this year. But, hey, man, it's the playoffs. It's a whole new world, you know. Julius Randle didn't have the best series, but not a lot of the other guys did too. They didn't shoot the ball well. The defense wasn't as good as it used to be. And Atlanta got hot, man. Atlanta's a hot team right now. They won that first game against the 76ers. They lost the second game last night. But they're a good team, man. When they – when they started shooting the ball like that, they shot lights out. So that's how I felt. And I think it's just a building year. A lot of people didn't even expect the Knicks to probably win 20 games this year. And they and look at them. They went out there this year, and they won like 40 games, I believe. Something like along those lines. I think they went 41 and 31, something like that. So I was just very happy to see how the team ended up playing this year. And I think, I think it's a step forward for the future. And they have a lot of cap space this year. They might go out and sign someone big. We don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I hope that, uh, you know, the Knicks play well and the Giants play well and every team goes to the playoffs that we Absolutely. support. And, that's, all yeah, we can, so you, that's all we can hope for as fans, guys, you know. We love to talk about them. We love to, like, create content about them. But all we want at the end of the day as fans is to see them having a good time and seeing them win ball games. Exactly, exactly. So we talk Giants, we talk Knicks, we talk Yankees, and uh, – Let's wrap it up here. Go follow JQ on Twitter at Jack underscore Corderaro. And then you can also go follow uh, at Talking Bleak Blue as well. That's a podcast, Twitter. And you can go follow us on Twitter at The Giant Take. Go follow me at Josh Ola 29, Alex at Anorian 23. And um, yeah, oh, subscribe to both podcasts. And I, I, I forgot I can do this when we have someone from another podcast on. Subscribe to both podcasts and give both of the podcasts five stars, rating or review, whatever you guys want to do. Talking Big Blue with JQ, The Giant Take, both really help out um, and we really appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to The Giant Take Podcast. We will see you next time for another episode. I'm going to leave a review right now. <laughs> and JQ's going to leave a review right now. We'll see you next time.